How's it going, everyone? This is Jeremy coming to you with another episode of Quantified Theory, this one on powering down your deck. Before we get started, like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and if you're able, support me on Patreon. I've got a bunch of exclusive content and the ability to do some live games with you. I'm really looking forward to that, super stoked for it. And with that, let's go ahead and get into it. All right, so let's figure out our purpose here. So the reason that this episode is so essential to me is that I want to encourage players in the commander community to play at a tier that is appropriate for with the cards that they're playing, right? And to, to get into that, enable engagement in multiple tiers of play. So if you are somebody who habitually builds at like a tier two, like you're not quite CEDH, but you're getting darn close to it. Um, I want you to be able to play at tier four or five and to be confident that you're bringing a deck to the table that's going to compete at that level. Um, it is hard sometimes to gear down decks, but I think that it establishes maturity as a deck builder to be able to look at decks and individual cards and say honestly and with a good amount of assurance that this particular deck is at this tier. Um, the second thing is I want us to be able to become better at card and deck evaluation by tier level so we can figure out which cards kind of fit and find their home at certain tiers and which cards maybe don't. Um, and that's not to say you can't play them on multiple tiers especially if you're playing them for purposes of like synergy rather than power. We'll kind of get into that a little bit later. Um, but these two things are excellent points, things that you would want to find uh, in a play group as well. Just like, hey, we want to be able to play across multiple power levels. We want to be able to honestly come to the table and say, hey, this is the deck that I'm playing. This is the actual tier level. I have built it such that, uh, built my deck such that it actually fits in this tier. So if you remember, uh, because I've released this episode by now, um, the deck building uh, format, right? So like order of operations here. The first thing is you choose a commander you think is interesting. Second is you identify core synergies. Third is you pick the tier level at which the deck is going to operate, and then fourth, you start choosing cards for it. So with that in mind, I think that we have to bring this fundamental uh, concept to our deck building process. The idea that before we ever choose cards, we have to pick our tier level, um, and that will allow different choices. You're not going to always pick the best staples anymore you're going to pick the cards that are going to operate at the correct tier level. Um, with that, I'll kind of move forward. We're gonna do uh, quite a few different examples of this, and you're gonna have the opportunity to kind of guess at which ones go where. So I've established a kind of a baseline for you. So a tier one, right? Um, the criteria for this particular type of card is creates lots of treasure tokens. So the tier one card for this is Dockside Extortionist. We all know it. There's certain people who are calling for a ban of the card um, just because it's so powerful. So Dockside Extortionist, for those who don't know, is a one and a red goblin pirate. It's a one, two. When it enters the battlefield, create X treasure tokens, where X is the number of artifacts and enchantments your opponents control. So generally, in a higher, more competitive tier, this is going to be creating like, you know, six, eight, whatever treasure tokens in a given turn. Um, with that in mind, what exactly do you think is a good tier two card that looks like this? Um, creates lots of treasure tokens. And by this point, I think that uh, you'll all have guessed it. And I think that a good tier two card is Ancient Copper Dragon. So this is a four red red flying six five. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, roll a d20 and you create a number of treasure tokens equal to the result. There's a little bit of randomization to this. Um, it's a prime reanimator target as somebody who plays a ton of reanimator. Uh, just being able to create X treasure tokens is insane. 
uh, and generally your average is going to be 10, right? So you've already recouped by the first hit the amount of mana spent to cast Ancient Copper Dragon. Uh, in addition to some of the crazy synergies that they've built in, which is like the new Agent of the Iron Throw, when, whenever an artifact, uh, a creature or artifact leaves the battlefield under your control, you nug everybody for one, uh, which is just crazy. I think that that's ridiculous. Anyway, moving on. Uh, if that is a tier two, what do you expect to be a tier three for creates lots of treasure tokens? And my take on this is that Horde Hauler is a good tier three. Um, it is a three and a red artifact vehicle with trample and is a five five. Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, create a treasure token for each artifact they control with crew three. Um, so you have to tap a creature, it swings in, uh, and then it's if it deals combat damage to a player, you create a treasure token for each artifact they control. Very good. It works really well. It's kind of a mini Dockside Extortionist, but I probably wouldn't be playing this at a tier two, right? It doesn't feel like it's powerful enough. Um, same thing with like Ancient Copper Dragon. I probably wouldn't play it at a tier three unless I wasn't running a ton of ramp. Um, there are exceptions to the rule, obviously, but I definitely wouldn't play Dockside Extortionist at a tier three. I think that it's just way too overpowered. Uh, tier 4, Reckless Endeavor, would be my next pick. So it's 5 red, red, roll 2d12 and choose one result. Reckless Endeavor deals damage equal to that result to each creature, then create a number of treasure tokens equal to the other result. Uh, so this is a board wipe attached to treasure creation. It's a one-time thing. It's not going to consistently be doing it over and over. Um, that's a pretty big deal. And... I would say that this in particular, like as far as the criteria, it creates lots of treasure tokens. This is going to do it. On average, it's six, so it basically pays for itself. Um, and then you have the ability to recover after the board wipe. It's very playable, but I don't think it's playable at tier three, right? Which is like your significantly upgraded pre-cons, like you've taken 15 to 20 cards and actually swapped them out and really streamlined the process. Um, I don't think you play this card at a tier three, but I also don't think you play Horde Hauler at a tier four um, because there aren't a lot of decks that are going to be able to make good use of that. Um, Reckless Endeavor just ends up being a little bit better for that tier. And the last is Brass's Bounty. This used to be like a really solid staple card. If you're running like treasure synergies and stuff, it's still really good. Um, it is six and a red for a sorcery. For each land you control, create a treasure token. So if you are uh, on land ramp, that's when this becomes better. Um, but it's a much, much worse version of any of these other cards because it doesn't have, have really any other function other than just create treasure tokens. Everything else uh, can either like board wipe, deal some combat damage, uh, or creates an insurmountable amount of treasure tokens for the amount of mana that it costs, uh, that being Dockside Extortionist. So the next example I want to bring to your attention, uh, the criteria for which is draws multiple cards in exchange for life. That's pretty broad, uh, but it had to be in order to make this work. Uh, so Ad Nauseam is my tier one example. It's three black black for an instant, reveal a top card of your library, put that card in your hand, you lose life equal to its converted mana cost. You may repeat this process any number of times. So I call this a tier one card because often enough you cast Ad Nauseam, you're going to win with that. Um, or in other tiers, you're probably not going to as often. You might play this in a tier two deck. Um, but if you had to guess, what would the tier two one be? Uh, you can pause the video if you want to, but I'm going to go ahead and go for it. So the tier two, I would say, is Necropotence, because the difference between Ad Nauseam and Necropotence is Ad Nauseam doesn't cap uh, Necropotence. Uh, you don't get the cards until your end step, and you also are capped at seven cards. It's the seven best, but it's still seven cards. So Necropotence is three black mana. For an enchantment, skip your draw step. Whenever you discard a card, exile that card from your graveyard. You can pay a life to exile the top card of your library face down. 
put that card into your hand at the beginning of the next end step. So like I said, the timing is what makes this more of a tier two card than ad nauseum. Ad nauseum is an instant speed, so you can actually do this um, right before your turn. Um, and that's really what like separates those two. I would still probably play Necropotence at a tier one because uh, life is very much an expendable resource at tier one. So being able to even just have your seven best cards all the time is very valuable. Um, and you can pay 20 life and not really be upset about that in that tier. But I would say that it is most appropriately put at tier two because of its limitations. Uh, the tier three version of this would be Peer into the Abyss. It is four black, black, black for a sorcery. Target player draws cards equal to half the number of cards in their library and loses half their life round up each time. So this is going to put half your library in your hand. The biggest reason for it being a tier three is the efficiency uh, issue, which you can get there with rituals, but you're going to have a very hard time doing it. Um, so on a classical curve, by the time you reach turn six, you will have ramped one to two times. Uh, so you'll be, this This is kind of a turn six castable situation, which means that if you have drawn the standard six cards, you have seven in hand, uh, then you will be drawing half of your library, which I believe amounts to uh, something like 44 cards at that point, 43 to 44, um, provided you haven't drawn additional cards during that game, but my guess is if you're playing Pure Into the Abyss, you probably have. The uh, limitation on this that puts it at tier 3 for me is the mana value, uh, so being 7 is the, the big thing. I don't think you end up playing it at tier 2 or tier 1 just simply because it's not efficient enough to do what you want it to do, and it's also at sorcery speed. Moving on to the tier four for this effect, I would say that Cut of the Prophets is a new one out of Streets of New Capenna. It's a great card. I think it should see more play. Um, X black black for a sorcery. Casualty three, so you can sacrifice a creature with power three or greater to copy the spell. You draw X cards and lose X life. So let's say you're playing this in a deck that creates uh, three three or larger tokens. Uh, you can go ahead and sacrifice one of those tokens. Let's say you pay, uh, we've talked about casting card draw spells on turn six as kind of a good default. Um, so if you cast it on turn six, you can cast it for up to eight mana. If you sacrifice a creature in addition, you're going to be getting 12 cards, losing 12 life out of it, um, which kind of equates itself to these other cards that we've been talking about. So Cut of the Prophets, good card, sorcery speed, in order to get the really good stuff off of it, you actually have to sacrifice a creature, um, and it is an X cost, so you really have to dump mana into it for it to work well. Um, and the last one that I would say is Greed. So this requires mana per activation, um, but it also is like a, a mana plus life thing. So it's three and a black for an enchantment. You pay a black, pay two life, draw a card. Um, Still pretty powerful, but I would say it's not uh, powerful enough to see a lot of play above tier 4, but I would expect to see it at tier 5 as a card draw card, um, just because the necessity to continuously pump mana into it is something that really limits your ability to play other cards. Uh, the ability to do that at instant speed is pretty cool. I like that. Um, but yeah, it usually is treated as kind of a burst draw situation. So when you are looking at these cards that we're talking about, choosing the nth best card. Um, so by tier level, you can kind of see how these go down, right? Uh, you can see that, okay, well, the speed continues to change. Uh, you have to like sink additional mana into it so it's not as mana efficient. Uh, you know, yeah, stuff like that basically is you're, you're looking at your mana value, your speed, your, uh, and it's, it's an essential function. You're drawing a bunch of cards, but 
choosing the card that's appropriate to the tier level. That's what we're going for here. So let's move on to the next example. All right, so the next one we're going to look at is counters a non-creature spell. The first one is a fierce guardianship, which is two and a blue for an instant. You're never going to pay that. If you control a commander, you may cast this spell without paying its mana cost. Counter target non-creature spell. Um, so this is a free counter spell, um, unlike stuff like force of will, force of negation. Uh, you don't have to pitch a card in order to get it to work for free. Um, so Fierce Guardianship uh, and Force of Negation also does the counter non-creature spell situation. So I'd expect that to see that at tier 1 or 2 usually, but not tier 3 or below. Um, the ability to play this and have no drawback is what makes it such a good card. In regard to tier two, Offer You Can't Refuse, I would say, is one of the best that's been printed recently. Again, a Streets of New Capenna card, single blue for an instant, counter target non-creature spell, its controller creates two treasure tokens. And you are pretty happy to give them two treasure tokens, which is funny because like the mana efficiency, or at least the, the mana discrepancy there, accounts to basically the same thing as playing a cancel. Um, like, you're, you are playing cancel in your deck because you are paying three mana for it. You just happen to be giving it to the other player. Um, so that's really interesting. I, I really like Offer You Can't Refuse. I actually uh, countered a overloaded Mizzix's Mastery the other day, and that was brutal for the person that had that happen. Um, but they got two treasure tokens, so it's fine, right? Um that's a good example of a tier two. Tier three, you can start seeing cards like Unwind, maybe. So it's two and a blue for an instant. Counter target non creature spell and tap up to three lands. This is a pretty, like, standard, common card, but it does cost three to cast originally, right? So we're specifically looking at efficiency as one of the things that differentiates the tiers. And uh, the ability to untap the three lands only comes after you've already countered the non creature spell. So that uh, the efficiency eventually ends up being zero, or uh, you can be man positive theoretically if you have like an ancient tomb or something, but you're probably not playing that at tier three. Um, yeah, so tier three unwind would I, I would say would be like the best non counter non creature spell that you would have in the deck. Uh, tier four you start seeing stuff like negate is the best non creature spell uh, counter non creature spell. So that's one in a blue for an instant, just counter target non-creature spell, doesn't have any additional text on it. Uh, it's a good card, you should play it. Um, you can see that probably at tier 4 or 3, I probably wouldn't be playing it above tier 2, and it would be in the lower tier 2 if I was going to be playing that. And then the last one is going to be Scatter Arc, which uh, is a three and a blue instant for counter target non-creature spell draw card. So it does self-replace. That's kind of cool. Um, but you are looking at uh, very low mana efficiency, uh, and that's going to be a huge differentiator for choosing that nth best card. All right. So by now you're probably getting a little bit tired of this, but hang with me. I promise this is a useful exercise. Uh, this criteria is exile target creature, and we're going to say path to exile and swords to plowshares are at tier one. They're a single uh, white mana for an instant. One exiles the creature, and then their controller searches their may search their library for a basic land card, put it into play tapped, and then swords to plowshares instead give them gives them life equal to that creature's power. Um, Swords to Plowshares is the better one of the two, just because giving your opponent life is relatively inconsequential in higher tiers. Uh, path, giving them a land, could matter. Um, so that would be seen as like a tier two as well, um, potentially even as low as tier three, but probably not tier four or five. Uh, tier two, I would say Angelic Ascension finds a good place there. So it's one in a white instant exile target creature or planeswalker. Its controller creates a 4-4 white angel creature token with flying. So you give them something in return, but you get to exile the creature or planeswalker. The hope being that the 4-4 flying angel is... Oh, excuse me. The 4-4 flying angel is less dangerous than the thing that they were going to 
have earlier. Um, tier three, you're looking at like a Winds of Abandon, uh, which does have an overload, so it can board wipe. Uh, and it basically is the sorcery speed version of Path to Exile for two mana. Um, and you can overload it for four white white, so basically it becomes uh, exile each creature you don't control situation. But uh, I've seen this really backfire because you're spending six mana and then in return you're ramping your opponent so significantly that they just outpace you. I almost wouldn't recommend playing this card other than for its main function uh if you absolutely have to for some reason you could potentially do the other mode but uh yeah the, the board wipe has definitely come back to bite uh tier four you look at stuff like crib swap so that's two and a white for a tribal instant shapeshifter changeling this card is every creature type um, exile target creature its controller creates a one one colorless shapeshifter creature token with changeling um, so again, you're looking at like your your instant speed, but less mana efficiency. Um, you give them something in return, that kind of thing. Um, does have some synergies, it being changeling. So like it, whenever you cast a creature spell of the chosen type, draw a card, stuff like that. Um, and then you can do like stuff like Settle Beyond Reality for a tier five, which is a five cost sorcery. Choose one or both. Uh, exile target creature you don't control or exile target creature you control and then return to the battlefield under its owner's control so again we're just looking at like the change in efficiency here and what that looks like um, as well as speed so there are certain things that you and when you're deck building you're going to think about which tier you're slotting it into right i'm i've already said this i'm going to repeat myself um, because this is the point I'm trying to drive home here, is choose appropriate cards for the tier level you're building into. And I think that generally, uh, when you're looking at something like a tier 3 deck, most people evaluate their deck as like a power level 7, right? Which would be a like low tier 2. So if that's the case, you almost want to not be running stuff like Swords to Plowshares because you're gearing yourself down you're trying to stay within that power level and uh, as a result of that um and this is going to be hard to convince everybody of and i realize that that's fine but i think that if we start intentionally building our decks into specific tiers that will have much more balanced games across the board. Things will be more dependent on stuff like player skill than they would on who can afford the very best cards or something like that. Um, not that I can say much. I do own some pretty significant cards, but uh, I'm also in favor of proxies. Play what you can. Um, pay what you can and play even more, right? Um, so choosing the nth, nth best card, this is Exile Target Creature. Let's move on to the, I believe this is the last one. Okay, we got one more. And the reason I'm not skipping this and just going to the takeaways on this episode, because let's face it, this has been a little bit redundant, um, but it's important, right? This particular uh, comparison is mana producing artifact. That's what we're looking at. And if you have looked at what differentiates the tier levels, one of those things is mana acceleration. And this is probably going to be my most controversial opinion that comes up, um, that certain mana rocks don't belong at certain tier levels. They don't find their home there. They feel like they are under or overpowered at certain places. Um, so the tier one I have here is Mana Crypt. Um, so that is a zero cost artifact at the beginning of your upkeep flip a coin if you lose the flip it deals three damage to you you can tap it to add two colorless to your mana pool which means that on turn one you can easily put out a three drop um, which is pretty crazy and i think that that is a tier one card for multiple reasons not the least of which that it's uh, a very expensive card it's 180 dollars something like that 
I have recently sold my Mana Crypt because I think that it is a Tier 1 card, and I don't think that that is the level that I want to be playing at at any given point. So giving that up was a kind of like step of good faith on my part to bringing my power level down overall. Um, so tier one would be Mana Crypt, and this is where you're going to disagree with me, and I'm okay with that. Uh, a tier two card is Soul Ring. I don't think it should be played under this tier. Um, and the reason being is because there are so many times when I hear things like, yeah, well, can't really beat a, a turn one Soul Ring and Tarkane Signet, can we? Um, and that level of, that's saying something. And it's not just salt, right? It's saying that you're playing a card that basically trumps the tier level that we're trying to play at. Um, Soul Rings being in pre-con decks, I don't agree with. I think that putting those in pre-cons introduces a card that doesn't fit the meta that a pre-con is trying to cultivate. Um, completely different card, but you know. And to take Soul Ring out of tier 3 and below decks will mean that you have a far more consistent gameplay. There's not going to be somebody that rockets into the lead um, at, at the early turns. You don't expect to walk into a game, I think, at a tier 3 and below and see anyone do the whole, all right, well, uh, you know, uh, Swamp, Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, go. And then on turn two, they just have five mana. I don't think that's something that you're tr looking to see in a tier three and below game. And so my encouragement to you, and some of you are going to be okay with this and some of you aren't, it's kind of that whole like uh, disarm situation. Um, opt to not play Soul Ring in your decks if you're playing at like a power level 6 or below. Um, and that includes taking them out of your pre-cons. And I realize that that is going to be a huge step for some of us, that it is a very controversial opinion. But my goal with this entire episode and really the goal of my channel is to create an environment uh, within the context of the commander community that we can feel like we're having good games and that we're setting solid expectations before they begin. And I think Soul Ring has the tendency to violate some of those expectations in your power level six or belows. With that, I'll move on. Tier three, Arcane Signet. I would say that this is the best mana rock in your deck when you're at a tier three. Um, just because it does a lot of work, um, but it is a two cost. It's not going to rocket you off to a very early start. Uh, tier four, maybe something like Star Compass, right? Which enters the battlefield tapped and you add to your mana pool one mana of any color that a basic land you control could produce. That is a two cost artifact. Um, it's actually a favorite of mine. I do really like the this card because it tells you, A, that you're running a lot of basic lands, so you're probably playing more on a budget or playing lower power. Um, and I like cards that have that indicator to them. Uh, and then tier five, I'll say Commander Sphere is where I would probably say is like the lowest tier of play. Um, three cost artifact, add one mana of any color to your of your commander's color identity. Um, and you can sacrifice it to draw a card. So you tap it, add a color, draw a card. Um, yeah. It generally is going to pay for itself. It's still a decent card. It's just not going to compete with the other ones that we've been looking at. So this is, in fact, the last nth best card slide that you have to deal with. Um, but I appreciate you sticking it out with me and uh, hearing me rant a little bit about Soul Ring, Mana Crypt, stuff like that. With that, we'll move on to our takeaways. So our takeaways for this episode, first one is determine a tier before building rather than trying to determine it afterward. I think that too many people will build a deck and just call it a seven when really what we need to say is I'm going to build a, you know, 
a five or I'm going to build an eight and I'm going to choose appropriate cards for that, which is actually the second point, which is find cards that fit the tier you're building into along the way um, when you're going through your bulk building your deck. Uh, this is the point where I think that we really have to diverge from our, our classical ways of doing things and we need to find cards that are in the tier that we're looking for. And if you're not sure about that, uh, find me on Discord. Ask me what tier I think a certain card goes into, and I'll try and give you an educated answer as much as I can. Um, I am happy to help with these things. My goal is to help cultivate a commander community that's healthy and establishes solid expectations. And then the last thing is every card has a home, but it may not have a home at every tier. So your pet cards um, do have a home, but you are probably not going to play your, uh, you know, Crater Hoof Behemoth in a five or something like that, a tier five. So that said, don't worry about it. You'll find a deck for that card. You will build a deck around that card eventually. Um, I love the card Fleetfoot Dancer. It is a new card out of Streets of New Capenna. It's a 4-4 four, four with Haste, Trample, and Lifelink for 1 and Naya. So red, green, white. Um, I love that card. But I probably wouldn't play it in anything that's over a 3. Because I don't think that it is competitive enough on mana cost to be able to get there. It's a very powerful card, don't get me wrong. But I think that finding the appropriate homes and then you will face a lot less disappointment when you're playing if you make sure that your deck is homed properly um yeah so if you have pet cards figure out which tier which home they belong to and then make sure that you build you put them in a deck that is appropriate for that tier all right well that's going to close it off for today thank you so much for watching the video, hearing me out on some different kind of crazy arguments. Remember, like the video, subscribe to the channel. If you're able, support me on Patreon. You can always find me at CQ Crunch on Twitter. Um, you're welcome to at me. I will be able to uh, see that and hopefully help you out with some questions. Um, there's also a Discord as well as I am on Reddit. Uh, so you can find me on all those places. I will respond as quickly as humanly possible. Um, with that, Let's close with this. Remember that rule zero starts at deck building. And with that, I'll catch you later.